Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, for those who study his biography, like so many of our leading scholars and leading luminaries in Islamic history, they seem to have never lost sight of the fact that it was their profile, how they looked in Allah's eyes that mattered most. That their most precious asset was not people's opinion of them, but the opinion of the one that truly mattered. You know, we're in an age now where everyone's promoting the self so much so that we don't even consider it narcissism anymore. We don't even consider it an illness anymore due to how pervasive it's become. Everyone's branding themselves. Everyone's asking others to like and subscribe, whether in that wording or otherwise, right? Some of us are better at hiding it than others just in terms of our social intelligence. We get to fake humility a little better than the next guy. Al Imam Ahmad truly was bent on not wanting to push himself forward. In fact, Imam Ahmad entrusted people to burn his fatwas at the end of his life. You know why? Because Imam Ahmad was the last of the four Imams, chronologically speaking, historically. And he saw how people had become too bigoted and prejudiced and stubborn with the fatwa of the previous great Imams. So he didn't want people to sort of take his words and crowd with them the words of Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or universalize them the way the words of Allah and his messenger can be universalized and applied in all these different contexts. And because of that, perhaps, that he didn't want to be the by all end all, that Allah chose him for this great legacy of Imama. And also the goodwill in the heart of Imam Ahmad was something that just glowed in his biography. You know, his son used to also hear him at the end of his life, after he emerged from the persecution and the prison that he went through, heard him always praying for Abu Al-Haytham, at tayyar And he's like, Dad, who's Abu Al-Haytham? He says, that's the guy who kept me firm in prison. You see, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, when he stood his ground during the Mu'tazilite Inquisition, the word of Allah is eternal, not created. He was not killable. He had too much status with the people late in life that they couldn't just kill him like other scholars who were in fact executed. And so they would make an example out of him. They bring him out, he's 70 years old, and they would lash him dozens of times. You know, when you gather all the testimony, some of those who whipped him said, every time I whipped him, I said, this time the whip is going to emerge from his mouth. Like his body was falling apart from how hard they were hitting him. One narrator says, we struck him once and his whole back sort of had blood clots. We struck him a second time, those blood clots rupture. And we struck him dozens of times each day. A narration mentions that when his blood clots would rupture on his back, another guy would come and take salt and stick it in his wounds. And every day he would think he was going to die and that's why he would fast so that he would meet Allah fasting. Rahimahullah. And every day he would almost break and say, okay, bring me the water. Then they bring him the water. Then he says, no, no, no. He tries to hold off for a few more seconds. In that atmosphere, Abu Al-Haytham comes to me, Imam Ahmad says, and says to him, oh Imam, stand firm. If you live, you're going to live glorified. You're going to be a hero. And if you die, you die shaheed. You die a martyr. What's the big deal? He's saying, oh Imam, if you go to the state records, you're going to see that I was whipped 18,000 times, like if you add it all up, 18,000 times in my life for the sake of shaitan. He was like a mini thief, not enough to get himself amputated, but like petty larceny. So he always get caught and beat and caught and beat. He said, I've been beaten 18,000 times for the sake of shaitan. So now you can't crumble for the sake of Allah. And so Imam Ahmad, when he came out of prison, he just kept praying that Allah forgive this man. Allah put his past behind him and reward him because he kept me firm. Allah sent that man to have Imam Ahmad hear those words because of a secret perhaps that Allah knew about his heart. Later on in life, he had this spot left in his back after everything healed. There used to be a doctor known as the doctor of the destitute. He would just for Allah walk around Baghdad, his city, and heal people who couldn't afford medical treatment. So one day he sort of stumbled on Imam Ahmad and he found him like in anguish from his back. He said, what's going on? He said, oh, Alhamdulillah, everything's fine. He said, okay, everything's fine, but what's going on? He said, everything my back went through healed eventually, except this one spot right here. And I couldn't figure out why and nor can anybody figure out why? This doctor says, so I made it my mission. I went back to the prison where Imam Ahmad was, the dungeons, and I went and I spoke to all the inmates and I said to them, you guys, any of you were around and Imam Ahmad was here? They say that something happened with his back and do you know who treated him? So one of them says, yeah, he was treated by a tailor, like a guy that sews. 
and he left something inside his back that he shouldn't have left in there. And so he goes back to Imam, he's like, bad news. There's something in there that if it sort of gets into your bloodstream, you're going to die. It's going to get to your heart and you're finished. I have to remove it. So Imam Ahmed goes into his house and comes back with two pillows, one for the doctor, so thoughtful, and one for himself. And he leans on it with a towel sort of over his shoulders. The doctor says, I lift the towel and I say to him, where is it exactly? He said, you point, I'll let you know. He said, here? He says, yes, alhamdulillah. He said, you sure here? He says, yes, alhamdulillah. He never stopped saying alhamdulillah every time the doctor poked him. No complaints. But yeah, right there. He says, so I took out the scalpel and I began to cut. And he kept saying, ya Allah, forgive al-mu'tasim. Al-mu'tasim was the president at the time when Imam Ahmed was going through all he went through. It was by his instructions, under his watch, by his approval. And so he said to him, you're supposed to make dua against people who mutilated you in this way. Why are you making dua for them? He said to him, I think about the day of judgment. And this man is a cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so I don't want to show up on that day having a dispute with anyone remotely related to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see how vivid and clear and certain reckoning was for him. One time Abu Hamid al-Khulqani, rahimahullah, he recited very basic words of poetry but very profound. Wherein a poet said, it's as if Allah Azza wa Jal is saying to a servant, did you have no shame on that day when you defied me? The poet says, recall my Lord says to me, have you no shame on the day when you defied me? And you hid the sin from my creation. And with that sin, you confronted me. You were ashamed of my entire creation, but you weren't ashamed of me with your sins in private. He said, Imam Ahmed said, repeat that. And so I repeated it one more time. And so Imam Ahmed went into his house repeating it. And I walked up to his door after him and I heard him having a meltdown repeating these words. What's it going to be like when my Lord finally says to me, had you no shame when you disobeyed me and you hid that sin from all of my creation and with that sin you confronted me. So Imam Ahmad's yaqeen was very real. Maybe the last anecdote I will share for you is the son of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. He narrates that on my father's deathbed, he kept falling in and out of consciousness. And every time he would come to a little bit, he would say, Laysa ba'd, Laysa ba'd. Not yet, not yet. And so we kept saying, not yet what? Even you feel like you're not ready to meet Allah? And then he said to us, no, no, no. Shaitan came to me and he said to me, you slipped from my hands, O Ahmed. And I was telling him, not yet, not yet. You see, he understood. He understood that even if you're Imam Ahmed, even if that's the life that you live, if you don't seal it right, nothing matters. They say one of the greatest janazas when he eventually died, rahimahullah, in Islamic history was that of Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah. It was innumerable. You couldn't count the amount of people there coming from every direction to pray janazah on this man. 